presenting and developing a technology for the brain and mind and body and all that stuff. Uh, it's called RBIM. Yeah, anyway, I was, you know, writing some blog posts about the NLP and uh, how people perceive language and perception. And the thing here is, uh, I was watching a YouTube video about Steve Andreas doing, you know, uh, a follow up 25 years later of uh, Phobia. Uh, he was performing back in, you know, 25 years ago, something like that. Anyway, he stayed there on the uh, follow up video that I cured your phobia. And I mean, if you have 9 billion people on this planet Earth, most likely uh, 8 billion, you know, 900,000, you know, 900, you know, 900 million, 900, practically don't care if he said that or not, or why he did say that and all that. If you're working for a nuclear plant and some one said uh, did something uh, the scientists or the people working with the nuclear power plant or something like that they probably would care and most likely you would also care because it would probably affect your life in some kind of way so you will be you know kind of interested oh what's going on there but if uh, some guy in, in a field that you most people never heard about or if they heard about it you know they're probably confusing the letters anyway because NLP could stand for natural language processing also and uh, here in Sweden we have actually a company who is uh, making milk and stuff like that and you can buy in the shop with the same letter. So he, he did say that you know he cured the phobia and in my experience that's not true. You know in the years I was working with NLP and hypnosis and all that stuff I could can't say that you know I went in and then cured the phobia of the you know client or whatever. Um, because if people say things like that, they don't understand what they're doing. People go like, well, what do you mean? He can't understand what he's doing? No. I mean, sometimes people say, you know, does the pattern work? Well, the pattern in NLP, if you do an NLP pattern, for example, or what some people call technique, you know, uh, it works if you apply it in the proper context. Uh, and it means that back in the day, and you know, 1977, 76, something like that. There was a book, you know, written about you know uh, the founders of an organization NLP. They had a workshop, uh, and they were presenting whatever he was doing at the time for some guys there that you know was therapist and you know working in the field. They was presenting the phobia cure of NLP at the time. So they're presenting the phobia cure, and the scientists there and therapists and all that, all those guys. You know, they were saying, like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. So, obviously, someone is, you know, call up their hand and say, can I use this for depression? And uh, the founders of NLP, no, it's a technique developed for phobia, not depression. Because depression is working differently than, you know, a phobia. Well, can I use this for, you know, because when people get a pattern or something like that, they, they, you do a generalization about, can I apply this on, on something else? And that's a good thing, by the way. So, you can take something with, that works. And then go try if it works in other people. But if it works specifically for a phobia or something like that, I mean, that's the first thing you would do. Can I, can I do this for a phobia? Okay, can I do this for something else? Well, most likely not, because the problem, the construction of the brain is different. The thing here is when people are, you know, learning NLP and teach teach NLP all the time, they don't understand what makes the change happen. Uh, and that means that you can apply the pattern, but uh, the change won't stick. Now, this happened to the best people out there. Uh, for one thing, it happened to Robert Dills back in 1988. He picked up a woman on stage and did the phobia, or whatever it was at the time, on uh, uh, LP, you, you know. He did that uh, to a lady who wanted to stop smoking. And two weeks later, she went back to stop smoking. You know, not stop smoking, because she started smoking again. So in essence, she never stopped smoking. Some people might argue, well, Robert Hills did this thing, and two weeks later, she started smoking again. So obviously, during that time, two weeks, she started to stop smoking. No. If she did stop smoking, she wouldn't start again. It might seem like that because, you know, she didn't smoke for two weeks. But, I mean, there's a lot of people who stop smoking and dietary and all that stuff for a few times, and then they start over again. So obviously, he didn't, you know, cured her, her or whatever you call it because the change didn't work 
So back in 1996, when I was, you know, involved and started up doing NLP here in Sweden, by the way, I'm you know, the or originator of Sweden's NLP, you know, boom of, you have about 15 institutes today or something like that. Uh, no one trained by me, by the way, what I know. And uh, since they're not trained by me, you know, that's, you know, kind of generalization you make and apply to everything. Uh, uh, that's kind of my sense of humor anyway. And uh, uh, this girl, this lady that Providence didn't, you know, help in, in, in a practical way, was, you know, complaining about the NLP. She did the NLP class, she did the NLP practitioner, was a practitioner, and she was applying NLP, you know, but she was still complaining about that guy, you know, deals that didn't help her, you know, stop smoking and all that stuff. And I, I was listening to her, what she was talking about, and I heard she said something. We had a big meeting, by the way. And she said something, I was thinking, oh, this is kind of cool. Huh? So I was thinking about that. And later on, we have a one day workshop presenting NLP for the Swedish audience and public, whoever was interested in NLP. I was you know, kind of running that at the day. And I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, that's kind of cool. So I asked for a, per, her permission to do this on, live on stage. And uh, she agreed, so I put her up on stage. Uh, I did something but which is really funny that Robert Hills developed the walking, you know, stuff like that. But I didn't apply it in a way that he would have done. Uh, and the people who, uh, a lot of those who was attending this kind of one day workshop, was selling the petition, most of the and none got what I was doing. And now uh, she stopped smoking, uh, she still smokes, by the way, uh, at the time and all that, but she stopped complaining. Uh, because I found that, you know, if people whine a lot or and all that stuff and still doing whatever they're doing, I was thinking, you know, I need to take care of the whining stuff. So she, she came back uh, uh, for uh, one day, uh, six months later or something like that, when I was doing a one day, uh, doing a two hour presentation, and she still said she was smoking. I said, I don't care about that because I, she didn't whine about that deal guy back in 1998. So when Robert Hills, you know, see this, or some friend of his see this, uh, they can thank me later. Uh, it's ten years after the fact, but hey. Anyway, uh, the thing here is, people, if you say I cure your phobia, like uh, C. Andreas did, you know, that's kind of a language that I'm kind of taking personally offensive, uh, because you can't do that. You can't cure a phobia. That's impossible. Because basically a phobia doesn't exist, other than a, you know a subjective process or experience in people's minds. So basically, it doesn't exist because you can't find a phobia out there in the world. That's a wheelbarrow, you know, kind of phenomenon. Phenomenon. So if you can't find a wheelbarrow, you know, put it in a wheelbarrow kind of test. So how can you then cure it if it doesn't exist? That's kind of a logic language, you know, expression of uh, reverse engineering or whatever you call it. So in my experience, some people say, well, what do you think about this, Robert? Well, my personal opinion is that, you know, if someone has a phobia and the change works, it always works the same way. Because you have to shift context for the individual. Now, some say, what do you mean by context? Well, time, for example, is a context. It's different if you have a present moment time, past history time, and future, you know, present time, uh, all, all different time, you know, and all this time or context. Because the brain just do what it does. So it means that you have a, what some people call it, well, a, a, a Pavlovian reflex anchoring going, oh, firing off, oh, I see this, oh, I remember, uh, you know, back in 1985, oh, yeah, yeah. You have a flashback. You have a, something that reminds you in, in the context and you flash back to 1985. Back in time, we like you know the those movies with the DeLorean. All you need is a DeLorean, and you can travel back in time or forward in time, whatever. It's time travel, anyway. So you go like that, and you're thinking, you know, hmm, flashback, cool. But the flashback, you know, lasts for about I don't know, few seconds, few few minutes. It doesn't last a week or two weeks, three weeks normally. Some people, you know, carry away the past history, like, you know, 
<laughs> or about whom I have was so heavy to carry this, you know, bag of stuff I have with me. And that's a metaphorical way of in, the, in the, how we perceive, you know, the past history and all that stuff. So if we, we don't carry that, and we use a future uh, context instead, then other things that we didn't, you know, remember or recall or memory or whatever, like, that exists in the same way. That's what happens. Okay. Some people argue, you know, well, does anything exist? Well, it's, it's conceptual. I mean, we have something we talk about, that's why we use language. And since if I say to someone, I cure your phobia, uh, people have asked me as a client, can you help me? I don't know, I say. I mean, I've been doing this for about 20 years, something like that. And some people are, you know, I had you know, people who are suicidal, or, you know, had diseases that, you know, the doctor couldn't cure and all that stuff. And people ask me, can I, can I do it? I don't know. Well, let's point out. Because that's the best thing. Because when a change works, and this is a big secret, it's always a, it involves a change of context. So whatever the phobia is or the anxiety is or the trouble or the problem is, when the change work or the shift or transformation, whatever you want to call it, works, it's always involved in the change of context. And people go, what do you mean about? Well, I had this client back, back a few years back. And she came to me and uh, she was in therapy for two years, two years in therapy. But she, she wasn't happy with it. For some reason, because she was really angry and you know hated stuff and all that stuff. So hey, she found me on the internet and you know come up and see me. So I was you know asking her one question, and I waited until she could answer me. It took about ten hours. In the second session, she could answer me, the, give me the answer to questions. And I, I think a lot of people, especially in the NLP, that you need to be to do a lot more information. Then you have to understand why. The pattern or the reality works the way it works. But most people in NLP is not trained that way. Most people are trained to, to make the pattern, use the pattern, so apply 10 patterns instead of you know, making the information gathering. And if I train people, I say, well, the change works. If you do NLP, for example, there's always one way it works every time. Uh, and it's not in the books or in the uh, education of NLP, just yes, you know, I can teach that. I've been, been teaching that to uh, people I train in NLP. Because I was thinking, you know, everybody was doing that, and I find out not everybody was doing that. Basically, none was doing that. So after nine billion people, you know, again, they didn't care because they didn't know about it. So I'm telling people again, teach that, and you know, exemplify that. But anyway, uh, it's a long story about that, but I won't go into that today. Anyway, so. She, she came up to me and uh, I did it one day and I, I was hammering her for five hours to make her answer the question. She went to get some pizza and she felt better after the pizza and I said maybe it's the pizza and she was like no I don't think so. But the, the funny thing for me was that she was actually considering that the pizza had something to do with her feeling bad. So she came back a second time a month later and I was hammering her for about two hours and she was out sitting up and was like Hmm, I don't have any problems anymore. And I was like, hmm, strange. She could answer my question. Uh, I was doing a practitioner workshop uh, training in, I don't know, eight, seven, eight years ago. And, and I, I was doing that and gave the, the participants an exercise. And uh, one of my students went out to work and they came back and was really tired. I was like, you know, watching them and said, what's going on? And it didn't work the way I. Uh, I could notice that because they were really tired. And I said, well, the reason that what you were doing was, was not working because the lady she was working with was born in Portugal or Brazil or some, some other kind. And she, she was born and raised in a Portuguese language. She was speaking Swedish. She was been living in Sweden for, I mean, 25 years, I don't know, 30 years. Um, so that one was one reason I said when you're working with some client you have to you know consider the overall complexity of cultures, uh, social you know context and all that stuff because it's always going to affect whatever is going on because that's how reality works and how the you know the brain is always creating an ongoing consciousness due to how it's you know perceive the world to be because everything we we do in here is perception about whatever is going on in there. So we don't perceive what's actually going on. And some people think that's a problem 
because yeah, I don't want to know what's going on and I go like well it's chem chemical and electricity and some things called uh, you know uh, neuron activity in different areas of the brain working out to make some kind of coherent speech about life and stuff like that that's my take on it anyway um, because you know some people say you know, they really want to know things that basically doesn't you know get to the answer and sometimes people talk about the universe and my take on it is our brains is not evolved enough to evolution yet to understand what how the universe is built or works and uh, we can to some extent understand that you know it's out there but how it was created and how it works and what's going to happen mm, there's a lot of things you know like again most people don't care about that if forever the the mail is not you know in the mail account or they don't get the mail in the you know letterbox or something like that then they get really upset. They go, why don't they? Or if you have a date or something like that, and they cancel the date, or if they don't show up, the people that's what people get really upset about. If the universe works or not, well, who cares, right? That's kind of different, you know. Most people don't, you know, consider what the universe is built. How many billions of galaxies out there, or whatever? <laughs> We're thinking, you know, that this is probably the only planet in the universe that's life. I would say I don't think so. But until we can prove it, and you know, have aliens or UFOs, UFOs and stuff like that coming to Earth or whatever it is, well, most people won't believe it. Most people will believe, you know, the center of the universe is Earth, because that's how God created Adam and Eve on Earth. Or maybe there was aliens coming here and you know, made some progress for us. Uh, I, I'd rather buy that theory actually. Anyway, the thing here is with language and perception is that whatever you're doing in, with um, NLP or uh, if you say I cure your phobia, my take on that, you don't understand what you were doing. And, you know, some people will say, well, maybe it didn't mean that. Well, if it didn't mean that, it wouldn't say that. And th th that's kind of languishing th that I'm, you know, going into that I take a responsibility for the client. And I, you know, uh, and, and stuff like that. And I said, like, I don't think change worked that way. I can't. Whenever I'm working with clients, the client will take charge and do whatever it takes you want to do, or not. I mean, I had clients who, who actually argued with me that they wanted to change now. And I said, I don't argue with people who are, you know, making it silly and said, either you go for it or not. That there's, you know, a change in a nutshell. You have to change context. And I had this client back in the day, I was uh, having back problems. Uh, and I went to him to fix my back. Uh, in the first session with him, he asked me about what, what I was, you know, my opinion about <coughs> believers in, you know, faith system stuff like that. And I said, I don't care. Basically, it's, uh, I have two, you know, either have humor or not. And what kind of care will you do for me? He was laughing. Well, anyway, he was fixing my back, three sessions. And then they called me and said he had a, had a trouble or problem for seven years. He came to me and he wanted to see if I could help him with that. And I was like, okay. So he came to me and he wanted to tell me everything about this problem. And I said, I, I don't care about that. I want to know what, what's going to be in the future when, you know, life works for you and all that stuff. And for 45 minutes, he couldn't understand my question because he was, you know, trying to, you know, tell me how this important this was, you know, for him. And I go like, mm, who cares? Nine billion people don't care about your problems. Unless you're a CEO for some oil company and your tanker is pouring out oil in Alaska and people and uh, farm life and animals and stuff like that, you know, sea lions, whales, and stuff, they get really upset about that. Uh, or if you're, you know, if it affects people around you, you know, people, then people might care. But not for the reason you think, because if you have a problem, who cares, right? Anyway, so he was sitting there trying to explain to me what it was, and you know, I didn't care, I said, what's in the future? Anyway, after 45 minutes, he was like, you know, oh, he was, you know, waking up, kind of, well, it was be a uh, windsurfing summer day, because he, he loved windsurfing. Anyway, after, I elicited the future of him, you know, windsurfing, all that stuff, and I said, this is kind of, you know, what life is about for you, if you let it, you know, kind of be that way, if you want. 
And the problem he had for seven years that he'd been, you know, trying to solve in a different way with different, you know, uh, wasn't an issue anymore. Uh, back in 2000, I was in a three day <coughs> event in Scotland. And one guy approached me after the workshops and he said, you know, I have pain in my body. And I go like, okay, so. Well, I was to a, a witch who was doing black magic. And I go like, okay, cool. Uh, that's not in the manual, by the way. Well, I had some NLP people trying to help me and NLP shamans and stuff like that, you know, energy and stuff. Woo! And they don't seem to help. And I was talking to him and I was like, you know, I was going to the hotel, I was tired, you know. I don't have time to, you know, do it. So I made some tests and finally, you know, I made the, I said, oh, you have to do this and the pain went away. By magic. Some people ask, how do the sleight of hand magic work? Well, actually, they, they are so good in making the, the, you know, the shift with the hands, the fingers and all that stuff. And if you uh, really pay attention, you will see that they all take, calibrate your attention where it is at any moment of time. And then they make the trick, you know, everybody's fluctuation. And even if you see what actually they do, it, you can't see it because the brain or the eyes uh, can't see the movement. It's too fast. Too quick. And people say, "Well, I'm, I'm, if I see it, I believe it." Then I say, "I don't think so," because if I mean, if you, if that would be, you know, true, uh, a lot of people who have been see, seeing what I was doing with clients and students and all that stuff would actually believe it. But they've been seeing what I was doing, and they call that kind of magic. And I say, "Yes, I know," but it's magic that has a science behind it. And people go, magic behind the science? Yes. Arthur C. Clarke said it best. For, uh, for an individual who has no clue what the science is, it will appear as magic. Uh, I mean, a magician, a illusionist, or something like that, doing, you know, card tricks, picking up a rabbit, whatever you call it, uh, they will think there is magic there. What it is is craftsmanship, uh, skill, and science because it will always work when they do that kind of evolution they're really good at that stuff and the same thing applies what i'm doing sometimes you know what i'm doing an nlp individual can't see they can't see what i'm doing when i'm working with a client i had nlp people who were trained by other people uh, in the same room when i was doing what i was doing and they couldn't see it and the, the thing here is they try to contradict what the individual themselves was saying if the individual the client whatever it is yeah, yeah i mean i work with elite professionals in in sport and i say if you do this you hit the ball in golf 50 yards longer and they do that and they hit the ball 50 yards longer they don't believe it even though they see it and even though they are still you know themselves doing it so even if they see it, they don't believe it because it's so out of the normal reality. Because I help them shift context so they can do whatever they want to do. And sometimes people have a lot of time accepting that because, you know, for example, I can teach you if you're a golf professional, a PGA or LPA or a ladies circuit or European tour, to make a shift in your swing in about three months from whatever you have now to something that you hit the ball both straighter and longer and be more consistently three months total shift that's beyond the science of the field by the way and what the neuroscientists say but they always tell you whatever they tell you because what that's what they have been confirming with current technology and the way of approaching things and most people don't think about you know things that i do uh, so I had this guy, you know, contradicting what the client was saying. It's like, you know, uh, if a call professional hit it 50 yards longer, they go like, what the fuck was that? And I go like, what, he hit it 50 yards longer? And I go like, that's, you know, impossible. And I go like, oh, I've seen something that's impossible. Because they have a hard time wrapping their head around that kind of, you know, performance increase. They go like, whoa, what's going on? I hit it longer. So uh, you have to spend some time, you know, making them accept that they actually hit it that long. And then uh, find a way to make it, you know, consistent. So, um, language, you know, and perception, in, in oh, most people don't care. Why should you care? I mean, it's probably some guy, you know. And this is what happens in every religion and culture uh, and sect-like, you know, you know, 
and people get into a field, someone does something that, you know, doesn't work really, or they say something that, you know, is really, you know, mm, I don't know what it is. But the people in the field won't question whatever's going on. They will accept it that this is how it should be, you know. So if Steve Andreas says something like that, I cure a field, but people go, oh yeah. Most people in you know, people won't react to that statement. They won't apply the meta model on that, you know. I cure the fuel, how could I cure a fuel but that when the phobia, you know, doesn't exist in the world? It only exists in the video. How could I cure it if it didn't do brain surgery? That's kind of a different approach, by the way. So people go like, oh, well, you know, if you say something like that, you, you know, you're talking about things and have different assumptions in your work, and I find that pretty much highly offensive. And you can quote me on that if you want. I don't care. And the thing here is, if the change or the transformation, all that, it's always a shift about context. Whatever reality problem you have now, if you have a context when that, you know, it's not true anymore. So you have this kind of, you know, oh yeah, that could be cool, but it can't happen because of all these people have these, you know, reasons and excuses and all that stuff. And I say, I don't care about that. I just want to know what this is like first before we do anything. And if you listen there after a while, people go, ah, you know, I'm kind of feeling kind of great now. But you have all this, you know. And this is creating, you know, uh, that kind of context shift and all that. Create a short-term amnesia, actually, because the brain don't, don't have access to the past reference or that stops to exist, by the way. And the RBIM process I've developed over the years, it's, it's about, you know, making focus of attention and stuff like that making sure the body is accessed and then right to the other vestibular reference system so you can, you know, tune in to the, with the body with the stuff, you know, where is it? I kind of find it. And, and to make make true of that, because this is happening in every yoga system out there. You have some yoga guy in India, you know, he's sitting there, you know, like, you know talking about, you know, stuff like that. And he would uh, talk about, you know, something and they would do something with the body. And the thing is, what he's doing with the body is more important than what he's actually saying. Just talking about it. So even though he has a representation of all this stuff, you know, that's kind of important, but basically what's really important is what he's doing with the body. And the context that's related to. Because the brain does just do context. It doesn't, you know, make a decision call of what context is going to be. You know. So if you can direct your attention to the proper context, and shift your, you know, transform or whatever, change your reality, whatever you call it, you want to call it. You can do that. And then you can have that your enjoyment, happiness, uh, in the soul, in the flow, whatever you call it. It doesn't mean it's a perfect system, obviously not. Some people are like, do, do that, it work 100% of the time? No. I, I'll go like, let's find out how much you can do it. Because it's a... Uh, you have to think about the reality most people live in, the social culture, you know, reality people have. It's not possible to tell me and they go, I listen, you know, a totally different experience for them, and they go, like, wow, can life be like this? And I go, yeah, yeah, it could be. And they go, like, you know, this is wild. Yeah, I know, and everybody in the world around you will uh, try to make you not have it. And some people say, you know, I don't believe you, Robert, because if you have this kind of, you know, experience and it's, you know, a chronic experience in, you know, it will, you know, fade over time because the neurons in your brain and the body will, you know, get, you know, you do it for a while and they go, oh yeah, I'm, no, I'm bored with it. Well, the thing here with the brain is that, you know, how faith works, that if you have a future kind of representation, then it's always new. So even though it, you feel it, or see it, or sense it, or hear it like it's always the same, it's actually not. Because in every moment it, it renew itself. And because that's how the brain can be made to work. Most people don't use the brain that way. Most people go like, hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. And after a few beers, that's what most people do. They don't go, okay, if I choose this experience and I uh, apply that, I always can have that kind of experience, always refreshing itself, and I go, yes. But how do you do that one? You have to learn, you know, apply it and test it and find out how it works. Because most people, you know, 
in how the brain works according to default, you know, default, whatever is going on in the cortex around them, that's how they respond to life. They come home, they see the wife and the kids and go, oh shit man. Or if their wife, they come home and see the husband, you know, sitting from the TV and the feet's on the table and the hand on, on the dick and all that like that. And they go like, oh shit. Instead of, you know, coming home and saying, hey baby. You can do that also. You can learn to do that. I had this guy who was working a lot and he came home and was drinking a lot of beers because, you know, he had to relax after work. And I said, why don't you relax before you come home? And uh, he, he said, yeah, can I do that? Yes, you go to my class so you can do it. Oh, okay. So he applied that and he, can, he, he stopped, you know, buying beers so he could, you know, when he was quitting his job, he shifted context to now his home. When he wake up in the morning, he was, you know, energized and fine instead of three hours of killing his kids, basically, in the morning. Some people are, you know, really tired in the morning. But you can, you know, make that so you can be energized in the morning, and, you know. You can learn to use your brain that way. You can teach yourself how to do that in a more consistent way. And the RBM technology makes that a lot easier. And it teaches you how to focus your brain, attention, where to focus it, and why you have to focus it that way. And if you focus on the future reference, and you have the future reference, and you understand where to focus it and what's going to happen in your body at the same time, and you access that and hold your attention on it, the brain will shift gears. And since it's a new brain, pads and stuff like that works you out, it takes some time for the body to shift, take about 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds you notice the difference in your body. I was driving in um, Malmö a few years back, the golf rack coach, he was, we were going to a golf club, he was going to do an 18 hole uh, practice run. And I told him, asked him about uh, things, and I said, Are we going to the golf club or are we already there? He said, We are going to the golf club. So, what's different if you are already there? And after 30 seconds, when he, I noticed he took the shift, and he was like, You know, I'm more free when I was driving the car because he was already in, in the you know, golf clubs making the golf run. And he played really well also. And the thing here is, it's always all going to be in your head and the body and all that. And we have to know understand how this works so we can start doing it a bit more. It's like this interflow stuff when I'm teaching people to do interflow. Because if you move your body and mobility of your hips, uh, joints, stuff like that, like this guy Scott Son in America, you know, you can get a high degree of mobility. That means you increase your fluid uh, walking and stuff like that and you increase your recovery time you go in, if you're working out you're going to recover a lot faster so you can have a higher quality workout next time and you feel younger it's a good thing and uh, if you have inflammatory you know diseases like rheumatoid stuff like that it will also help with stuff like that so it will prevent injury and it will help you recover you know and it will boost your immune system at the same time also because if you're not stressed out if you do this, you know, you can't be stressed out at the same time either. It's a win-win, or a win-win-win-win-win-win. But you have to do it practically every day for about three months to get, the, you know, the effect of it. And most people go every day for three months. Yes, it has to take about five minutes to do, or less, depending on how, how advanced you want to do this. And people go like, can I do that? You know, I can move my arm and my body like this. When I started out, I was like this. I get, and it will stop. So, I mean, my movements, at first when I started, I was more like this. And today, I, you know, I'm kind of more like this without, you know, killing myself on the only car. You know, anyway, I was just, you know, talking about the NLP, you know, language, you know, representation, stuff like that. And most people don't think uh, the language and representation people use are important. I, I take that very seriously. And I see when someone who is an NLP, you know, old guy, uh, using the language of IQ, if you feel I would, you know, red flags, stuff like that, goes up and we're like, oh, what the fuck is this guy doing? It doesn't matter for me who he is. Because you as an NLP practitioner don't cure any phobia or problem or depression or whatever it is. The client does. You can show them some options about that and whatever they want to do. But essentially that's the client's work to do. And I don't agree with people who say, well, we, I do this unconscious stuff because I'm showing people whatever they want to have and they have no idea, their life just transformed. And I, I can't say I you know, kind of agree on that. 
I guess that it, um, people who, uh, you know, the dumpbed, you know, they tell you that, uh, you know, the river reverse back sooner or later. So it's, some people say, what are you doing? Is this unconscious work? No, I say, it's, it's basically whatever you want it to be. So you have to do it. Just what's our behind the ball. Raise your own consciousness and awareness so you can start doing things that you want to do in a way that makes you more, you know, whatever, happy, be able to do a sport performance pattern and all that stuff. Fun stuff, as I like to say. Anyway, now I've been talking too long and too much and too much fun. So I have to go through something else that is really fun also.